How's everybody doing? Did you guys just watch the movie? Yes? You guys just watched the movie, right? So you know who these people are, right? Not me. We've got David Gordon Green, writer-director right here. All right. Paul Rudd and Emil Hirsch. My name is Matt Singer. I work for a website called The Dissolve. And uh, thanks for having me. Thanks for having us. How you guys doing? Fantastic. Good. You you have something you want to address, I know. Yeah. I you want to get, want to get it off your chest right now? Oh, yeah, yeah, now that I'm at Google. So if you type in my name on Google, my profile says that uh, the Google profile says I'm 5'5". Five five. That's not true. I'm 5'7 and 3 quarters. <laughs> when you're 5'7 and 3 quarters, 5'5 five five sounds fucked up. No offense to anybody who may be 5'5 five five or close to 5'5". Five five. It's fine if that's who you are. But I was, yeah, but, but you know, when you're not that, you, you know... It's just it's not a big deal. I just figured, you know, I'm in the offices of Google. Can we just get this taken care of there. right now? Anyone? I'm just throwing that out there. Maybe afterwards someone can take care of that. All right. We threw it out there. I'm sure by the time this is over, we'll go on Google and it'll be right. Uh, so maybe they're laughing like it's not, but I was I was I was serious. Um, I was gonna be five one. They're like, ask us again, bitch. See what happens. Five five was uh, close enough. Four ten. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, let's. <laughs> while they're fixing that, let's talk about the uh, the movie. I, I walked into the movie, you know, not knowing much more about it other than you guys, and then I was really surprised to find out that it was, you know, a remake of another movie. I had no idea, and it didn't feel like one to me. So. Uh, maybe you can talk about uh, the origins of the project. Reading a little more about it, it seemed like, you know, it wasn't like you saw the movie and wanted to make that. It was, there's kind of an interesting, unusual process there. It's a little bit backwards, yes. Uh, I found, uh, I was, I was uh, directed to go to this state park in Bastrop, Texas. Uh, I live in Austin. It's about an hour outside of Austin. And some friend, uh, a friend of mine was telling me how interesting this, this particular state park was after this wildfire has swept through. Uh, and he said, you should go to check this place out. It's really cinematic and interesting, and you should make a movie there. So I went to the park and checked it out and thought, oh, this is really awesome. I should make a movie here. Um, but what was beautiful about it, uh, it, it is also our, it, it's also kind of the devastation of it. Like, it, And it was this kind of apocalyptic, monochromatic forest, that, uh, and it went on for 25 square miles. I mean, it was just an enormous, very catastrophic wildfire that people lost their homes. Um, a number of people actually... Uh, Filmmaker Richard Linklater, some of his property was affected by it, and you know some um, people that I knew, and so it was interesting, kind of walking through this place, thinking about it as a very haunted backdrop location. And I thought this is a, it'd make a great place to make a movie um, that kind of had that kind of strange beauty, sad thing going on in it. Uh, I need to come up with a very simple story, something cool that I can do really, really quickly before the forest turns green again in the summertime, and. Then coincidentally, saw a, a friend. I was telling a friend of mine that lives up here, uh, was a production designer up here. I was telling him this pl beautiful place I found. He said, "I said I need a really stripped down, uh, simple narrative that then I can get great actors and make a great character piece." And he said, "Well, I've heard about this Icelandic film about two guys painting stripes on the road. Why don't you just remake that movie?" And I said, "I asked him if it was any good, and he said he hadn't seen it, but it sounded cool." <laughs> Who cares? You're going to remake it. Exactly. So that's kind of what I, I hunted it down. I said, okay, I can't wait to remake this movie that I haven't seen or no one I know has seen yet. Um, and I started watching it. And I was like, no, this is really good. Um, and I really responded to the movie. And I sent it to Paul. And he liked it. And we said, what the hell? Let's try to get the rights and do something with this. And use it as a, as a great blueprint. Some, some of the dialogue is taken precisely from the movie. A few shots are even taken uh, directly from the movie. Um, and then we tried to personalize it. And each of us kind of put our fingerprint on it and... Uh, elements like the woman that Paul's character Alvin encounters in the burned down home wasn't in the screenplay, but it was an illustration of the opportunity of making a movie like this where you can just open it up to that. And that's a, that was Joyce, and that was her home, and that was her story looking for her pilot's license, and just like taking advantage of the beautiful, sad, oddity, funny, strangeness of, of this environment became a, a, a great journey for all of us. And once we uh, got Paul and Emil on board, it really just kind of became its own, its own very special, very personal project. What were you guys attracted to in the material that you uh, wanted to be a part of it? 
Well, at first for me, it was working with David. David and I have known each other for a long time, and I've always wanted to work with him, and I, I think he's great. Um, I, Emil w wasn't on board. This was when uh, Emil wasn't attached to be in it or anything because when I first heard about it, and David was like, "Hey, man, why don't we get some cameras to go out and you know?" And, then he, and, and I was, I, I didn't even have to tell me what it's about. But then he said, "There's this Icelandic movie about two guys that paint the lines on a road." And I thought, that sounds awesome. <laughs> like I like that. That sounds. Well, super... I get to paint the lines. Do I really, and it was such a treat to actually get to paint the lines. Um, <laughs> but I, I just thought, oh, this, this would be a, uh, one a cool experience to work with David. And then I'd never met Emil, and I was, and then when Emil came on, I was excited about that. But ultimately, the uh, idea of doing something that was purely artistic that w it was never about oh this will be this will get picked up we didn't even know if it would you know be in theaters or anything like that but it was um just a really fun exercise to kind of get in touch get back in touch with what it is that we love about doing this in the first place how about yourself in that sense? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think that I really even realized that we were making a movie for most of it because, well, the script was only 65 pages and the, and it was only a 16 day shoot. And, and every time I would ask David, like we'd be shooting a scene and I'd be like, so is this going to like be like a movie? And he'd be like, I don't know. <laughs> and I'd be like, well, is it going to be like shown in theaters and, or like, what's it going to be like? And he's like, this is going to be very weird. Let me just tell you. And I was like, okay. And he goes, yeah. And I was like, well, how, how is it going to be distributed? He's like, I, I don't know. Maybe he's like, maybe we'll just show it to our friends and family, like over like drinks and dinner. <laughs> That's got to fill you with confidence. And I was like, okay. I mean, so, I mean, I, I thought it could be a movie, but I didn't really know it was a movie. And David kind of was very like guarding about, he never actually said, oh yeah, this will be a movie that's going to come out or anything like that. He went to the screening last night and really, he's like, oh my God, it's a movie. <laughs> yeah. That's, there it is. <laughs> does that does that give you some freedom though? Because it seems like you know, seems pretty relaxed. Seems like there's very little pressure. It's not like we have to make this and get it in theaters and you know. It seems yeah, like I mean, we well, well, when we were shooting, nobody even like nobody. There was no like press about the movie. It was it was like we basically shot it in secret to like David's design, right? Yes. David. <laughs> there's always pressure because there's um, other people around and. Uh, and there's a crew around. There's like a guy that's like holding a mic, and there's somebody that's filming it, and there's somebody that's you know setting up cones and doing all sorts of set design. And David's there directing, so it's like there's always pressure because, I mean, acting is just stupid and, and embarrassing anyway, <laughs> just by design. It is. I think it's more embarrassing to be the boom guy holding it. There's no non awkward way to do that when you're doing it in front of people. It's like yeah, <laughs> that's true. I like when the guy kind of cocks it on his. Yeah, he thinks he's so cool. He thinks he's really cool. Yeah. No, I don't think I say he thinks he's cool. I think he's smart because he's it's it's so hard to do. Have you ever tried to do it? It sucks. <laughs> it's terrible. A lot of times, you know, I we've worked on things and the takes go long. Like sometimes we'll just ah, oh, let's just play around and we'll we'll improvise. We'll see where it's going. And it, it's that's so fun to do as an actor. And it's terrible as a boom guy. Yeah, he's checking into the ER the next day. <laughs> Literally. Like we're not designed to just stand like that the whole time, look for twenty minutes, and I can't even do it for two. It's so thank you, boom guys out there. Big ups to the boom guys. Yeah. Um, there are a couple of really great scenes that I wanted to talk about. You mentioned one already. That scene where you're walking through that house that's been sort of you know destroyed, and you find this woman. What an amazing scene! And could you just walk through? You said it wasn't in the script. It wasn't in the original movie, right? You just how did you find that? Was, you just found the location? Did you find her? How did it work? Well, we were looking for locations. It, it evolved quite a bit in the movie, I'd say. like the, In the script, there was a sequence where uh, Paul's character in his lost weekend, uh, when uh, Emil's character goes off to the city, his character, one of the sequences was, was going to be this funny sequence of him going into an, a, a burnt-down home and pantomiming his way through it and talking to someone that wasn't there and then having like ghost sex with his wife. And it was going to be hilarious. And when we were looking for locations for this funny scene. <laughs> um, I just like watching his face while you yeah. describe it. Yeah, I just thought it would be kind of a funny, like, invisible person's, like, you know, I don't know, uh, provocative scene. But um, we got into the process of looking for this location for the ghost sex scene. And, 
and and then my producer Craig Zobel and our assistant the director Attila had were out looking about for locations, and they they were they found Joyce looking through the ashes of her home, and they started talking to her about potentially using her house as a location, and then got into the conversation of her and her particular situation of losing everything in her home, and uh, what an amazingly interesting woman Joyce was. And after they had um, spoken with her, they called me and said, listen, we found a location that's great, but more importantly, we found a woman that's incredible and somehow needs to be integrated into this project. So sure enough, we went out and... Um, and she, I don't, I don't think she was aware, uh, kind of like a meal. She Did wasn't really was sure that this was a movie. Um, but so, you know, Paul kind of directed that scene, and we kind of went in there very discreetly with a, a cameraman and a sound guy, our boom guy, and uh, uh, and Paul just talked her through her situation. She, none of that was scripted. It was all just kind of things that were regurgitating the story that had been told to our friends previously. And it was such a beautiful moment, just being there on set and watching Paul's interaction with her. I mean, I just got chills, and, and it really was, uh, again, there's, there's things that she said that made me laugh and things that were just really upsetting. And the, the truth is every, every crack in her voice is her holding back tears because she lost everything that was meaningful to her in her life. And she says things like, I'm looking through, I feel like I'm looking through my own ashes, and some really powerful, gripping things that were, were said. And for me personally, and I think for, for Paul as well, and in all four of us that were on set that day, it really changed the tone and the approach to the rest of the film. That that funny pantomime scene ended up being a heartbroken scene of Paul sitting in a chair, rocking back and forth, lonely in the rain, um, and very much simplified and, and drained of comedy. Um, and the, in the rest of the film too, I think, um, although I think has great laughter and great you know, moments of humor and... and um, these guys really did a great job, in my opinion, of balancing uh, the comedy and the drama of the film. Uh, but we really were, our, 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 our project became much more emotional after that interaction with Joyce. And I have to say, having a movie that has such a low profile and is under the radar and made in secret means that we don't have this expectation of people. You know, there's probably a few diehard fans of the Icelandic film either way, and there's a few, few of those guys that would be, would be shocked and horrified that anybody dare sabotage their their beloved film. Um, but here we could kind of just make our own thing and, and make some discoveries and take advantage of those opportunities. What was that scene like for you, Paul? I mean, watching you, like, talk to her is so fascinating, too. It, w it was, an, a, you know, a really kind of emotional experience. And it was for her, clearly. Uh, and it took, we were there for a while. I mean, obviously longer than what you see in the film. But to have somebody just give you a tour of their house that is rubble and uh, see all the emotion played on her face, um, it was, I, I, I was nervous that I might say the wrong thing, I think, through some of it. And... Uh, and and I and actually felt uh, very attached to her after we finished shooting it because uh, she was so vulnerable and so open and so fragile. Uh, it was kind of impossible to not get caught up in it. Has she seen the movie? She, yeah, she saw it at South by Southwest. It was really interesting. She brought she brought her best friend. She called her best friend at eleven. The, it was going to show at like four in Austin. Um, this like last March and. I was going to show up at 4, and she called her friend at 11 and says, I'm in a movie. Do you want to come see it? She's like, what do you mean you're in a movie? She's like, yeah. And then she shows up, and her friend's like, she didn't ever tell me that this had happened. And then she shows up at a movie, and her friend was very much a fan of, of Paul and Emile's work. She's like, why, why did I not know my best friend was just in a movie with these guys? <laughs> she never, never, never happened to cross her mind to tell me. Uh, I think that's really funny. But she was, she was really proud of the movie and, and, and you know, really seemed very sincere in saying that it was kind of a, a, a turning point in her processing of that event and just having somebody there to listen that cared. It was, um, I think, it think, seems like a very meaningful thing for her. And we've had some screenings for, um, we had a benefit screening last week for the fire department out there. And, and it's really interesting seeing the various audiences that we've, we've exposed to the film. And like for them, it's this hardcore, like mystical, um, dramatic film about um, about overcoming this uh, the circumstance and other audiences you'll see gets huge laughs and other audiences find it very meditative and lyrical and others are kind of grabbing onto the heartbreak element of it so uh, and others just think it's a you know boring movie with a kick-ass soundtrack so well it does have that I think is indisputable for sure uh, you, you mentioned we mentioned already the painting the lines on the road this job that you guys are doing out there is I mean 
would it really be two guys by themselves with one little thing? Or is there some poetic license? Is that from the remake or the original movie, I should say? In, or In the original movie, it was like a dude with a roller on a brush. So it was even more hardcore. These guys at least had some mechanics. We had act an actual machine. A truck and a step up. And you got to paint lines on the road. Mm. Are they still there now or do they immediately get replaced? I think no, it was like a special paint. Yeah, we had to, we had to hose it down afterwards. Yeah, they didn't, they didn't want our weird art project on the middle of their park road. Yeah, because some of those roads, it was like if you had divided into two lanes, someone would drive off the road because it wasn't that big of a road. We're painting bike lanes. <laughs> I was like, that could have been in the movie at the end. You wait a second, maybe a huge maybe cyclist truck driver do just goes off without. The- <laughs> um, maybe you know this could definitely be me reading a little too much into the movie, and if it is shoot me down. But I'm wondering how much of the making of this movie is about the making of this movie. You know, your guys made bigger movies, little movies, and you've made a bunch of big ones, and now you're kind of making a small one again. And the movie is about kind of going out alone, how you describe the process a little bit, getting a small crew and kind of getting back in touch with stuff. I'm just wondering if you looked at it that way at all, whether you were sort of commenting on your own experience, you know, it's based on another movie, but to me watching it, I could sort of see like an autobiographical autobiographical element to it. Well, I, I think a lot of that's unintentional, but it's Fine. not, it's, but it's it not far from true. And I, I, after making the last few, few projects I'd worked on were of, of substantial size, budget, and expectation, I think stripping it all away and, and stepping out into the wilderness, much like Alvin does, is, is something that is a part of my personality, and I have a place in Colorado I disappear to as much as I can and try to keep my head screwed on straight when it gets a little wobbly. Um, and this this project was kind of doing a professional version of that. Um, you know, again, getting um, being able to, s- to strip away so much of the paperwork and politics of movie making and just the, wor- the nuances of performance were essential to this. Um, and it really was just the, you know, the Walden Pond of, of movie making. The, uh, the other scene that I wanted to ask you guys about is the, uh, I, th- I, I would describe it as the bad connection scene, which um, I loved as well. Tell, was, I mean, I'm guessing, I could be wrong again, but I'm guessing that was not scripted. <laughs> I don't think that was, was it? Yeah, the, um, I, yeah it, was, it, it was fun to do. Um, and I think, it, you know, we knew that there was going to be some kind of Build up and some sort of kind of uh, letting loose that these characters had to have, and it was probably going to be alcohol infused. Um, bad connection, I think, came from <laughs> just the way you said it. I'm sorry. All that good stuff you, you said about Boom Guy, you guys don't sound like the, a huge hypocrite because yes. remember it was our sound guy that yeah. we named it after. Yes, yeah. bad connection. That was what we called the sound guy. That was his nickname. <laughs> Bad connection. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. So we sang it. We made a song about him. We just called it "Bad Connection." We sound like hypocrites now. We just sound like dicks. But you know yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but here's 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 the novelty. So this is what's going to inspire you to watch the movie again. It's the very beginning. The the song that Emil's character uh, puts in the tape player uh, when he gets tired of listening to the language tapes. After we'd filmed the movie, which is Im- improvised by these guys, but based on. A little, a little piece of tape marking on the, on the, um, on the sound pack of the boom operator that said "bad connection" because he was referring to the, you know, the the cable connection. Um, and then they improvised the song. And then, and when we when we loved it in the editing room, we just had so much fun putting it together that we had uh, an artist write a song as if these guys were riffing off the song and just didn't know it very well. And so, when you watch it again, you'll notice the uh, the song that plays like an '80s rock version of "Bad, bad Connection." connection. <laughs> That's like the most fun part about song. making movies. You get to really go deep into something absolutely stupid. <laughs> and that no one would recognize unless they watched the movie 16 times. Well, that's what I was going to ask. Has anyone noticed it without you telling them? Never. Oh, definitely It will never not. happen. Uh, we'll get to some audience questions maybe in a minute or two. So if you have some questions, start percolating them uh, uh, right now. The other member of the, the cast is that the truck driver is fabulous as well. Uh, but is a, actually, he's a actor not someone you found right he was lance he was Legault. cast lance yeah um, yeah you know lance was amazing i met him i was doing a dodge commercial in tehachapi california and there was a background actor that was i heard he was talking trash 
and I heard like I was trying to you know figure out this fleet of this n- the new fleet of Dodge cars were gonna blaze through this town, and then there's this guy just like loud as hell over in the corner. And I look over and he threw a lawn chair at a kid. It's like, <laughs> who is this guy? And then I looked at him and I, I was keeping an eye on him, I was making sure he didn't go berserk. And uh, I saw he looks really familiar. And then uh, I started talking to him and r- realized I did recognize him. He was like in some A-Team episodes and a bad guy in some Magnum PI and he was in Stripes for a minute. And uh, re- really kind of interestingly, he played with Elvis for 15 years, um, that singer, Elvis Presley. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and traveled the world with Elvis in a bunch of his movies and it's just this larger than life personality and that was right when we were putting the movie together. So I thought it would be cool to, uh, to bring Lance out and be play the, the old kind of cantankerous truck driver, which isn't far from who he really was. Um, and, uh, and I liked him mainly because I knew Emila would be terrified of him. I oh, was going to yeah. say, your scenes with him are so fun to watch you yeah, in no, those he, scenes. I mean, he would just, he, I never knew what he was going to say next. I mean, I remember one day I was sitting with him and his wife, and he had his oxygen tank on the other side, and he had his oxygen on. And I was asking him a question about girls or something like this, and he was like, let me tell you something about girls. In the 1960s, I was with Elvis, and I played bass in Vegas. And I used to knock off two or three pieces of pussy a day. And he was, he was eating peanuts at the time, and the peanuts were, like, hitting me in the face. And I, like, look at him, and then I'm just, like, look over to his wife to, like, make sure she's not, like, twisting the oxygen tank. Sorry, Paul. Um, and, uh, but he, and she just had a huge smile on her face because she knew, you know, that was Lance, and he was just a beast. And uh, I, I was, like... I just never, and sometimes, you know, I think the, you didn't use too many, but he would, like, grab me and shake me and, like, I mean, like. There's really, one thing that we didn't use where he really, he smelled a fart on set and he got mad. <laughs> and he would, there's just a take of him looking at Emil, pretty convinced that Emil farted. And he's young, very deadly serious. Who farted? Yeah. He was terrified. <laughs> He was, he, I remember we were sitting next to him, and he goes, and he just kind of out of nowhere, he goes, you know the problem with kids today? No grit. <laughs> I was like, I know, I have none. I knew I've never, I've never felt less gritty around anybody than Lance. Well, that sounds like it could be a line from like the next Anchorman or something. I could hear that coming out of the voice of one of the characters or something, maybe. Well, that was, that's great. Are there, do we have any questions from the Googlers in the audience? Yes. Um, so, first of all, I actually lived in Austin, um, moved here pretty recently, and I was on, on Cinco de Mayo, I was next to you guys eating at Kura's Grill, so it's good to see you again. That's pretty amazing. <laughs> How was your dinner? <laughs> it, was aw- <laughs> it was awesome. What did we have that night? <laughs> I don't know. It's nice to see have, you, too. They have bananas in the rice, That's if that recalls anything. But anyway. I remember did you we- vividly. I- I didn't bother you guys. It was looked like you had a good time, but it's good to be here now. <laughs> anyway, I was wondering what the title um, is. Prince Avalanche, the title of the Icelandic film, and that was just like a nod to loyalty, or why did we keep the avalanche portion when we were clearly in Austin? Not an avalanche country. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The title. The, uh, I just think it's a really cool title. It, 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 the Icelandic film is called Either Way. Uh, you should all hunt it down and find it because it's a good movie. Um, Prince Avalanche was um, it was a title I kind of I woke up with uh, after a strange dream, and um, in in my dream I had a dream that it was a cool title, and then I woke up <laughs> uh, and it it and it really was a cool title. So <laughs> it was kind of in the same kind of creative melting pot of time that this project was coming together. And it seemed like a good idea. But with the avalanche part, would you say in France they 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 don't like it because it's too close to Snowboard. Yeah, they thought it would be about snowboard, so they've changed the French title to Prince of Texas. <laughs> not a terrible title, I suppose. Uh, it's not Alvin and Lance together. They kind of sound... Al- Alvin and Lance? Yeah, Alvin, Lance. You put them together? That's what I thought. If his name was Lanch? Lanch. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's yeah. close. Yeah. It's kind of close. Yeah. And, it, and it's Avil. <laughs> yeah, Avil and Lanch. <laughs> that would have been amazing. What? We were, we, Admittedly, it would have worked better if those were their names. But. Yeah. And instead of Bad Connection, we just listen to a lot of Prince songs. <laughs> <laughs> that sucked. That was terrible. I'm so sorry, Google. God. I should have to switch my browser for that. <laughs> Another question right here? Yeah. 
Yeah, hey guys, how's it going? Thanks a lot for uh, for coming and showing us the movie. Really appreciate it. Um, I actually had a question, just a general question uh, regarding the the improv the, the improvisational nature of a, a lot of the scenes that happen. I know Dave, uh, David, you're you know you're pretty experienced with uh, you know regarding uh, Pineapple Express and uh, you know uh, Paul with uh, Judd Apatow movies, things like that. It seems like there's a lot of deleted scenes with a lot of just improv that, that's happening. Um, I was curious for the for the scene with with Emil, um, the the I guess disappointing the disappointed weekend where you actually start crying in the middle. How much of that was uh, was just you kind of off the cuff rolling with it, or was there was that scripted? Kind of how did that whole scene kind of play out? That scene was actually almost completely scripted. Um, I think I think almost to the word. I don't know. That was just a really long kind of scene and. I wasn't really just going off the cuff or anything on that one. I mean, there were some scenes where there was elements of, you know, improv, but not never too much. It didn't really feel like like when I watch it, I don't think of like I mean, most of the dialogue was in the script, I feel. Is that, surprise, surprise. Is that accurate? Most of the dialogue was in the script. There's a good bit. I I, I don't ever look I, I honestly don't know because I haven't read the script since before we made the film. I, I, I don't I don't find scripts particularly sacred or that interesting. Uh, I think if if actors respond to it and it works for them and it feels believable and we're rolling, then great. If not, we'll throw it away, we'll come up with something new. Um, I mean there's plenty of sequences that were kind of designed out of just the moment. Um, particularly um, when Emil's out of town and Paul's wandering around, all that stuff was just kind of whimsical thoughts that we had, a list of a few agendas, and then we filmed things. Uh, so the camera did its own version of improvisation, but um, I just don't I don't hold any dialogue super, super close to me as being super valuable other than what feels honest. Questions from the crowd? Oh, someone is... It's a race. Go. <laughs> Who will win? You, you won. Go ahead. Congratulations. <laughs> now you, your reward is you get to ask a question. Great. Um, well, first of all, the movie is beautiful, so I just want to say that. I love the scene where you guys are in the road right after you've met the truck driver and all of the trees are super vertical and the lines are on the road. So nicely done. <laughs> and now I'm going to apologize because I have a question for Paul. Um, first of all, congrats on the anniversary of Clueless. <laughs> It was a super important piece of my childhood, and I think I could quote at least 75% of the movie. Um, I read somewhere that you auditioned for like a lot of the major male roles in the movie, and I'm curious to hear, if you weren't going to be Josh, who would have you chosen to be, and how do you think your career might have been different as a result of being a different character? Great question. Oh, that is, Sorry. yeah. Excellent question. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Um, when I read that script and I went in to audition and I met Amy Heckerling, um, the parts, I, I, I think I, my initial audition was for Josh. But um, I thought, oh, this is, there was characters I'd never seen before in movies. And I remember thinking Christian was a great character. And I think that was the first one I thought, wow, a really cool gay character I hadn't seen in a teen movie. I hadn't seen that. I I'd like to audition for that. And I really wanted to audition for, I thought it, it would be a great character, would be the one that um, Donald Faison played. But I didn't realize that he was black. <laughs> I thought it was I thought it, yeah I thought it was like a uh, a white guy trying to be black. <laughs> Another thing I can't do. Uh, but uh, I, and then I auditioned for Elton, which was Jeremy Sisto's part. And then finally, uh, Amy Heckling said, "Well, would you read for Josh?" And I said, "Yes, absolutely, absolutely." And so I auditioned for that part, and then um, the rest is history. And. Uh, I'm just still a little upset I didn't get misguised. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Was there a question over here? Uh, yeah. Is this thing working? I didn't prepare uh, quite so specific a question. Uh, anyway, I was wondering uh, if you guys could talk about how Explosions in the Sky got involved in this movie and uh, how their music sort of influenced the, the tone of your editing and how it all came together. Great question. Uh, Explosion in the Sky, for those of you who don't know, is a, is a wonderful band, Austin-based band. Um, 
they collaborated with my longtime composer, David Wingo, to put the score of the movie together. We've been talking for a long time. They've done songs for two of my films previously, so I've had that relationship. We go way back, and uh, a lot of us live in the same neighborhood. And so, actually, the, the whole reason I went to that park in the first place is the drummer from Explosions, Chris Rasky, uh, told me about it. And he said, you got to go check this park out. Um, I remember we were watching the Super Bowl and, and just kind of um, talking about cool shit to do and he's like go make a movie in this park so that happened and then um once it started kind of fleshing itself out we we just started talking about making a, a bigger partnership about the, of the movie and it was really cool and a very unusual experience in that the, uh, the musicians would come to set and spent time hanging out got to know the actors got to know the environment and the tones and started going home and writing themes and so we had kind of an idea of of where we would go in the editing room. Typically in the editing room, we'll you know grab a score, some songs from other movies, and edit to them as kind of a temporary foundation for where we want to go. Um, you know, half the time, the problem with that is half the time you uh, use like a movie score, and then you just have to hire a composer and say, kind of rip this off, but because we really like it, but make it your own so we don't get sued. You know, so there's a lot of those kind of problems you have in in editing. Or here, it was really just a luxury to be able to walk down the street and go over to Manoff's house and he's working on this thing over here and the guys, the musicians, um, uh, we'll go over then to David Wingo's house and there's, you know, we'll bring our friend Mike Tolley to come beatbox for a track or a clarinet player comes in and so we kind of could mess around with some of their signature sound and expand that a little bit um, and then walk over to the editing room and spend a little time in there. So it was all very, um, very much like a, a high school class project. Like it was very casual and laid back and, and, and strangely efficient that way there wasn't a whole lot of back and forth and note sessions and this and that because we're engineering it together i mean it was probably a four or five week post-production period which is you know hardly time to get a rough cut in most movies and we were done with the score and done with the cutting of the film because they were done simultaneously and the in the in the uh, the soundtrack comes out so cool i think it's uh the soundtrack's actually uh coming out on the sixth so if anybody liked the music then uh, go check that out. It was really cool. The other day, I don't know that you know this, there's two dudes dressed up like you guys painting a mural in Brooklyn to ever, for the for the album. No. It's really cool. They specifically <laughs> dress That's like? Wearing, I mean, the, we, we sent the costumes and the helmets. They had the overalls, and they were out over in Bedford, I think, out in uh, Brooklyn. Did anyone know what they were doing? Or Probably were like, no one thought that was strange at all no. in that part of Brooklyn. Just some weird, like Mario and Luigi just chilling, painting on the side. Painting a mural. Did, did you um, give them the mustache, too? I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't see them. I saw a couple of snapshots. I'll show you some pictures. Some weird ones, too. <laughs> was the mustache your choice? Was it David's choice? I think it was Yours, mine, yeah. yeah. Why, why did you feel so strongly about the mustache? Um, I, I just remember I wanted, like, because it's set in 1988, but it's not, um, it wasn't, like, the wedding singer, you know, it wasn't like a movie. I was like, "Oh, we're gonna really lampoon '80s fashion" or anything. It wasn't that at all. But I wanted to have something that was like a, a little different. And I, I remember, I wanted to have kind of Sally Jesse Raphael glasses. <laughs> I thought the combination of those and a mustache and kind of like short hair, but then a little curlier on top seems. I think I knew a guy that kind of had that look, or that was like friends with my parents or something around that time. And and it, and I thought that takes it out of. Um, hipster too because that was a that was a concern redefines hipster <laughs> i don't know if it redefines hipster <laughs> uh but but I, I yeah i thought that and it also seemed to go along with the the rugged nature that this character thinks he kind of has but we kind of like refer referred to alvin as like uh i mean for somebody i reference a lot is kind of like summer camp counselors from like this this very Christian camp that I went to as a kid. And like there's always this guy with a guitar singing songs with his shirt off and his mustache. It's always really the El Bar C ranch. Or the guy that <laughs> the guy that like when he talks to you to try to be cool with the other students like flips his chair around yeah. and like leans on S the back. Sits on it backwards. Yeah. Hat backwards. Yeah. Which you do in the movie, right? Don't you have a move that move? You oh, yeah he does I do. I do <laughs> turn around when I go over to listen to his story. I flip the chair. And that chair by the way was like made for Two year olds. It was such a small part. Another thing that was just like, there's so many little things that would just make us laugh. It's like, why don't we just be sitting on a really small chair? Yeah. And you remember the day the day that we did the scene where uh, Alvin's talking about how he, you know, what he does, he reads, paints, sews, and he used to have, pres he has a lot of prescription medication. Right. That scene, we could not keep a straight face. Well, it was also because it, it just kind of, it, it, it kind of, 
uh, I had, took care of my pet before it was killed. And it, there was like no explanation <laughs> beyond that. Just like, I had a pet and it was killed. And I just kind of like say it and then move on to the next thing. That just really struck me as funny. <laughs> I still laugh at that, but yeah. There, and, oh, yeah. Yeah, well. <laughs> We are, yeah, I think we're running out of time here. If there was any one last question, anybody? No? We'll, we'll end with the uh, striking it funny then, I guess. Guys, thank you so much for coming. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everybody. Thanks a lot. <laughs>